Howdy. And thank you for being here. Uh, for those of you I don't know, my name is Mark Welsh, and I am incredibly lucky to serve as the Dean of the Bush School of Government and Public Service here at the Bush Center at Texas A&M University. And I'm lucky also tonight to be able to welcome you to the William Waldo Cameron Distinguished Fellows Program. It is really, really wonderful to have you here. The Cameron Fellows Program was established by an endowment to the George and Barbara Bush Foundation from Flora Cameron Crichton as a memorial to her father. The intent is to bring remarkable leaders and consequential ideas into the classrooms and the auditoriums of the Bush School. Um, and that is exactly what's been happening this week because our Cameron fellow is attending classes. He's meeting with faculty members and helping them think about how they teach government and administration and general management. Uh, he's meeting with, with students in the hallways. He's having lunch with old deans. He's, he's just educating us all. And it's been phenomenal to have him here. It is this entire endowment, this fellowship is an incredible gift to the Bush School. And I'd like us, if we would, to remember Flo Crichton tonight for her incredible generosity and also to thank two trustees of the Cameron Foundation who joined us here tonight. Ms. Grace Labat is here along with her husband, Robert Swartz. Thank you so much for being here, ma'am. And Mr. Peter Atherton is here as well along with his wife, Catherine. Thank you both for joining us. Also here tonight are a couple of my cohorts in crime from here at the Bush Center. Uh, Mr. Max Engerholzer, the president and CEO of the Georgia Barbara Bush Foundation is with us, along with uh, Dr. Bob Holtzweitz, who is the acting director of the George H.W. Bush Presidential Library Museum. Bob, thank you. <laughs> Porter, you didn't sneak in while I wasn't looking, did you? Okay, good. Porter Garner was trying to get over and he wasn't sure he was going to make it. The same with Greg Hartman. Greg, you didn't sneak in, did you? All right. Um, we also have, are lucky tonight because um, it's always lucky when we have this guy come back into town, but our founding director and professor emeritus of the Bush School, Dr. Chuck Herman, is here along with his equally talented wife, Dr. Lorraine Eden. The executive associate dean of the Bush School, Dr. Frank Ashley, is here. Member of the University of Alabama College of Education Hall of Fame, retiring this year after almost 40 years in public education. Frank, thanks for being here. <laughs> we also have a couple of our department heads. Dr. David Burse, who's the department head for international affairs here at the Bush School, is here with us tonight, along with Dr. Lori Taylor, who I'll tell you a little bit more about here in just a moment. Um, Bonnie Dunbar, did you sneak in? I didn't see you in the lobby. There you are. Um, this is one of my personal heroes, for those of you who don't know her. She's director of the Aerospace Human Systems Laboratory, a professor of aerospace engineering, a former NASA astronaut, a five-time space shuttle crew member, and an American hero, Dr. Bonnie Dunbar. <laughs> And we also have from the Bush School Student Government Association, our president, Trinity Gibson. Trinity, thank you for joining us today. For our Cameron Fellow, just to make sure you know, sir, we also have local community leaders here. We have faculty, staff, and students from across the university. We've got loyal friends of the Bush School. We've got great Aggies of every stripe, just like your dad, here with us tonight. Um, thank all of you for taking your time to be here. We'll get the evening started with some comments from our Cameron Fellow, and then Dr. Lori Taylor will join him on stage to continue this conversation. Dr. Taylor, as I mentioned, is the head of our Public Service and Administration Department. She's also the holder of the Joe R. and Teresa Lozano Chair in Government, excuse me, in Business and Government. But she's also a principal investigator for the Texas Smart Schools Initiative. She's a member of the Holdsworth Center Network of Scholars. She's on the governing board of the Regional Education Laboratory Southwest. She's written extensively on school finance issues, and in fact, she's developed two separate wage indices that are seen as the gold standard in that business these days. She was named a Distinguished Fellow of Research and Practice by the National Education Finance Academy. She earned her PhD in economics from the University of Rochester and spent 14 years as an economist and policy advisor in the Dallas Federal Reserve Bank before she joined the Bush School. So, sir, if you start talking budget, be careful. <laughs> She's, she can run with you on this one. Um, we are very, very proud of Dr. Lori Taylor, and uh, who will join us up here on stage in just a second. But back to our Cameron Fellow. We are incredibly blessed this year to have a great American as our Cameron Distinguished Fellow. You can read his bio in your program, so I won't read it to you, but just let me mention a couple of things. First, his parents were very close friends and supporters of President George H.W. Bush 
from the very early, not so successful days of his political uh, career. Uh, our speaker grew up knowing President Bush uh, as a friend of his parents uh, and being inspired by him. He happens to be the longest serving Republican Speaker of the House in Texas history, 10 years. The incredible thing about that to me is that he was elected speaker just two years after being elected into the state legislature, which says something very clearly about his leadership and his ability to move things forward and to communicate and, and inspire people. He is a very successful businessman, remains actively engaged in business, consulting, political studies, and political leadership activities. Uh, I think it's clear to all of us that he's immensely talented, but he's also a very proud Texan. And if you talk to him for just a couple of minutes, you'll find out he's an even prouder husband and father and a wonderfully nice human being with a soul for public service, which is what we embrace here at the Bush School. We are so privileged to have him here this week and with us tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Honorable Joe Strauss III. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dean Welsh, for that um, gracious introduction. Thank you and all of your team as well for the incredible Aggie hospitality this week. Um, and howdy. I am really honored um, for this opportunity to participate in the Cameron Fellows Program this week uh, for a number of reasons, starting with the fact that as uh, Dean Welsh said, that Flo Cameron Atherton Crichton was someone our family loved and admired greatly. She was a neighbor, um, a dear friend. Flo was a uh, mentor to my mother, Jossie, back in the, I guess, the early 60s, when Flo was, um, I guess that was about the time that she was a National Committee woman, with RNC and uh, my mom was getting involved in Republican politics. Um, Flo was a very generous supporter in all of my campaigns, but much more importantly, she was an early and very important and constant supporter of President Bush and Mrs. Bush. So when Max called some time ago, when we were all sequestered by the um, epidemic, um, pandemic, the answer was an enthusiastic, heck yes, I'm gonna be part of this. Anything that has, that combines flow and the bushes, count me in. So um, I've enjoyed visiting with the uh, bright and promising grad students the last couple of days here at the Bush School who not only make me very proud um, of the school, but also very optimistic about the future. Tomorrow, I get to speak with some undergrads, so hopefully their questions will be a little easier for me to answer. Um, it's also unusual for a former Texas legislator uh, to, fo to, um, to follow in the same lineup with some of the big names I've seen um, advertised on the walls in the school, people coming up like FBI Director Christopher Wray and um, Director of Central Intelligence, William Burns. So, if there are any Russian spies in the audience tonight, you are likely to be very bored with what I have to say. <laughs> now, when these two, um, two heads of intelligence agencies are here, maybe some of you Aggies can ask them to try to figure out what happened to the offense last season. And I have to tell you that this trip has been much more enjoyable for me um, and much more fun than when my father, proud Aggie class of 1950, 96 years old now, he still brings me to A&M so that I can witness the Aggies beat up on my Vanderbilt Commodores in football and basketball. <laughs> Thank goodness for college baseball. We still have a shot. But Texas A&M means a great deal to my father. And so it means a great deal to me, and it has all of my life. I also appreciate any trip to this campus and to the Bush School and library in particular because I so deeply admire President George H.W. Bush and First Lady Barbara Bush for their contributions um, to our country. 
My impact on President Bush's service and his presidency was at best immaterial. But his impact on my public service and my approach to dealing with others has been profound. And it, that impact continues on to this day. I saw a video clip recently at the Bush Foundation dinner in Houston where John Meacham described it in plain but very powerful terms. He said, what George and Barbara Bush did at the pinnacle of power is a case study in just do the right thing. And the Bushes were remarkably good at that. It's kind of amazing to realize it's been 30 years now since President Bush left the White House. The global balance of power is different. Communication platforms are different. Politics is certainly different than it was three decades ago. But in the weeks leading up to my visit here, I've been reading and reading through some of President Bush's letters and remarks and speeches, and I've been struck by a couple of things. First, the impression that Dana Carvey did of him was spot on. <laughs> no wonder the president enjoyed it so much. But secondly, and more importantly, his words resonate because they are so powerful and so different from what we have come to expect from politics today. Standing on what he called the front porch of democracy to give his inaugural address on January 20th, 1989, President Bush said, I take as my guide the hope of a saint in crucial things unity, in important things diversity, and in all things generosity. In a present era when partisanship has risen and tribalism has spread, it's remarkable to hear a newly sworn in president of the United States talk about those ideas with such conviction. Today, the way to get ahead in politics too often is by appealing to someone's worst instincts rather than the better angels. We see, we see coalitions that are built around common fears, not common purpose. We've been conditioned to think that the path to power is through dividing and conquering. You win by pitting the right groups against each other. For a long time, politics in Texas has been protected from the worst forms of partisanship. Nobody showed the, the uh, virtues of bipartisan governance quite like then Governor George W. Bush did when he worked with a Democratic Speaker of the House and a Democratic Lieutenant Governor to compile, compile some very important victories for the state of Texas, from education and welfare reform to tax relief and needed changes in our civil justice system. And that bipartisan tradition has often continued. When I was Speaker of the Texas House, I never felt the need to apologize for appointing chairs of committees from both parties and from all over the state. In fact, one of the things that I liked about serving in the Texas legislature is that the biggest, most important issues that we deal with are not really partisan. Issues like water, infrastructure, mental health care, public and higher education. Of course, that doesn't mean that bipartisanship is easy. One time, we debated a bill, a bipartisan bill, to stop changing the clocks for daylight savings time. But after a debate that went on far too long, the bill got voted down because nobody could understand whether the Dallas Cowboys football game would still begin right after church. <laughs> but what really killed that bill was they couldn't sell beer at the stadium until after the kickoff. But bipartisanship lives. Um, but when it comes to the issues that really matter, you need people with different experiences and perspectives working together. I found that no party has a monopoly on good ideas, and sadly, on, not on bad ones either. And regrettably, we operate in a political system where bipartisanship is not often rewarded. Most legislative and congressional districts are drawn to either elect a Republican or elect a Democrat, rather than having a competitive 
general election that either party could conceivably win. This has happened all across the country in red states and in blue states. As a result, many elected officials are making decisions based on what they think will help them survive in the next primary. They make the assumption, sometimes true and sometimes not true, that primary voters will always reward party purity over pragmatic governance. This is why the divisive social issues get so much attention. After all, most, most people do not vote in primaries. Only 3 million Texans in a state now of a population of 30 million voted in either the Republican or the Democratic primaries in 2022. There was 2 million Republicans, 1 million Democrats. And that, what are there, 18 million or so registered voters? So 1 million and 1 Republicans made the decisions for all of the rest of us. One of the most challenging parts of my job as speaker was to convince legislators to look past the primary and do what they thought was right for all of their constituents rather than doing what they thought their primary voters wanted. Fortunately, we had a lot of members then who did the right thing and have consistently been rewarded, even in divisive, difficult primaries. Two of them are right around here, Representative Kyle Cassell and Representative John Rainey. They both do a good job and they get reelected. State government continues to work in Texas because there are dozens of legislators just like Casal and Rainey, in both parties really, who quietly go about the work, the quiet work of governing rather than chasing headlines and trying to stir up outrage. Like President Bush, they have a clear sense of right and wrong. And then as John Meacham said, they just try to do the right thing. Nationally, we still have a lot of work to do. Once again, we're approaching a presidential election. It seems like we're always bracing for the next election or fighting about the last one, and sometimes at the same time. But as we start to hear more and more about the candidates preparing to seek the White House in 2024, I hope all of us will try to, to do a little better in terms of what we expect and what we will reward of our candidates. David Axelrod has talked about the advice he gave to then Senator Barack Obama when he was weighing whether to jump into the 2008 election uh, and take on Hillary Clinton. Axelrod told Obama that voters almost always prefer the remedy rather than the replica of what they already have. I can think of no better remedy to our national political climate than the words that President Bush spoke and the approach that he always embodied. It is the same thoughtful, selfless approach to service that is taught here at the Bush School and that I've witnessed in the students after just a couple of days. We know that most people are fundamentally good. Every day, people go to extraordinary lengths to extend a hand of help or compassion, whether it's in their job or in their spare time. Our communities are filled with people who sort the canned goods at the food bank or who donate to GoFundMe pages for strangers who are going through a tough time or even who become foster parents to children who have experienced trauma. So why should our politics be so different? I recently read that one in five Americans actually believes that we should divorce into two separate countries, one consisting of the blue states and one consisting of the red states. I understand and certainly President Bush understood that there are going to be differences and that politics is a contact sport and in every campaign there's a winner and there's a loser. But we can be competitive without being caustic. 
And I believe this country is hungry for women and men who talk about governing from a place of understanding and compassion. The remedy to our politics is leadership that knows how to tap into our decency, how to govern with restraint and with a respect for personal responsibility, but also how to lead people toward charity, kindness, and community. One of the more powerful political gestures of this last year was when President Biden and Senator McConnell set their differences aside and appeared together to celebrate their collaboration to deliver infrastructure investments in Kentucky, a state where they both obviously have constituents. It was an encouraging moment, and it reminded me of another notable passage in President Bush's inaugural address. When it made clear that he would be president, not just for the Americans who voted for him, but for all Americans, he said, to all I say, no matter what your circumstances or where you are, you are part of this day. You are part of the life of our great nation. The principles that President Bush promoted are bigger than any one party or ideology. Decency and goodness transcend any construct of conservative versus liberal or red versus blue. I'm not naive about the forces that push our elected leaders toward divisive politics, the need to win in low turnout primaries, political consultants who put wins on the board at any cost, and a news media that feeds on conflict. Still, I believe Americans are ready to turn the page and support an approach to politics that just a little more closely resembles the decency that we see in the rest of our lives. That's the remedy. The remedy is the unity, diversity, and generosity that George Bush celebrated in his first moments as our 41st president. And the burden is on all of us, candidates and voters alike, to make room in the conversation for those who bring us together by appealing to our sense of goodness. That's exactly how all of us can just do the right thing. So I will close just by thanking you for inviting me to be here this evening and this week and this opportunity to be uh, a participant as a Cameron Fellow. It means a lot to me. It's an honor and I'm grateful to all of you who have made this school such a fitting and successful tribute to a great president and a fantastic public servant. Thank you all very much. Those are wonderful and inspirational remarks. And it was really, uh, I think, very inspiring to be thinking about trying to get past some of the partisanship that we're experiencing. Um, how did partisanship, because it, you, it's not like it's a new phenomenon, but how did partisanship affect your terms as Speaker mm -hmm. of the House? Not as much as they do in Washington. Um, fortunately, in the Texas legislature, we don't, we've resisted the um, temptation to organize by, by party and by dividing across the aisle, as they say in Congress. And um, I mean, I think most of, the, most of the conflict that I had to deal with politically and um, was, was in my own party. Mm -hmm. It wasn't the Democrats, they weren't much of a threat. I mean, they were when I was first elected speaker, there were 74 of them and 76 Democrats. Um, but the real ugly fights were really within the party. Um, so that was, that was the challenge more than anything. But as I, as I said, and I mentioned Casal and Rainey and so many others, even in the Republican caucus, all during my time, and it changed you know, considerably. Every year there were a whole lot of new members coming in. Um, but all the way through, 
there are always many, many more um, you know, constructive people than there were destructive people. Mm -hmm. The, the Texas legislature only meets during odd years. Uh, so is that odd contributing? Odd indeed, yes, that's right. <laughs> is that contributing, that, that need to go back and do something else for a year, is that contributing to the ability to see across partisan divides or? Say, what, the, 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 with the legislature only meeting for, oh, yeah. in the odd numbered <clears> years, <throat> it, it seems like there were, the, the legislators were deliberately they're, they're part timers to a certain extent. Yeah, I mean they're, they're part time, but it's it's largely full time. You have you have essentially a year in a two year cycle. You have a year of governing and you have a basically a year of campaigning. Um, but I I really defend the system that we have in Texas where we meet for um, 140 days every other year, and really only. 80 of those 140 days can you pass a bill? I think the framers were, were genius. If you're like me and you support limited government, um, it should be difficult to pass a bill, not easy. And, um, and it isn't, it isn't easy. Um, so I, I defend it. I also think that, and we had this discussion with some of the, some of the scholars today, I also think that having a two-year budget is a good thing. I know only a few other states and small states have the same system that we, we do. Um, I'm always asked when I go to conferences of legislators, um, how does that work? How can a big state operate on a two-year budget? Things happen. You have to adjust, right? Why don't you have a, an annual budget session? And I, just, I, think it's, I think it's a good thing. I think it focuses the attention on the longer term, if two years is a long term, and it, and it also reinforces a sense of um, restraint that you don't really know, and the mostly good thing, the comptroller usually is fairly careful about the, mm -hmm. about the forecast that you can budget from. Um, so I think it, it, it builds in some restraint and some um, you know, some, some safeguards um, and, and some discipline. So I, I, I defend our, our system. Mm -hmm. Great. So clearly that, that, that system is an idea that maybe we promote that other states should adopt. What have we learned from other states? What ideas have we adopted from elsewhere? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Won't hear of it. Um, you know, <clears throat> I don't think we've adopted much knowingly from other states. Um, one, one area, I'm going to have a couple of examples I can probably give, but one area that concerns me and that I saw over time was this whole concept of model legislation that certain interest groups would develop. They would actually write bills and then push them down into as many states as they could get them to pass. And, you know, this whole, this whole ESG thing now, there's a, whole, there's a whole slew of these bills, started mm -hmm. mostly in Texas, um, but other states too, and they sort of catch fire. And um, the red states pass these model bills that are very conservative, and the blue states, I guess, pass theirs that are modeled after something else. But I think that's, I think that's not a good thing. I always in, encouraged independent thinking, developing solutions that were really more tailored for our state than somebody else's, and just more original ideas than being handed something from a lobby group. So that's, that's something I think we need to guard against. Um, there's, there was an example of, um, of Massachusetts being, being, the, uh, being the model for mental health legislation that we passed mm -hmm. in Texas. Um, in 2017, we began to more seriously address mental health in Texas. We were kind of on the front 
edge of that. A lot of states are doing it now. Um, and in 2019, there was a mental health um, healthcare consortium concept that was mm -hmm. adopted and a children's mental health care consortium uh, bill was passed, all modeled on Massachusetts law. It required <clears throat> the state um, to, I don't think there was funding involved in, in this, but it did um, require more coordination and more collaboration between local mental health providers and the state. And that was that was all outgrowth of, of Massachusetts. Now we put our own twist on it um, in some ways because obviously the geography and the demographics of Texas are different from Massachusetts. So in, in our approach, we also um, strengthened our telemedicine mm -hmm. and our telehealth um, abilities um, to to treat people with mental mental illness because Texas is a you know tough place to reach everyone. So Massachusetts was a was a guide in that in that um, in that in that instance. Okay. What ideas from Texas are you particularly proud of that you think that other states like Massachusetts should adopt? Oh gosh, um, <laughs> you know, I remember when I was first elected, um, we were we were not as high on the list of public research universities as we should have been. And Texas A&M, University of Texas, yep. um, were the exceptions. <laughs> there was Rice, and that was it. And Massachusetts, mm -hmm. I think, had nine. California had about that number or maybe more. And so we, we did address that. And now um, there are, a, I don't know what the number is, but we're, we're I think we've matched now mm -hmm. um, Massachusetts. So that's not an answer to your question, but it's something I can brag about. <laughs> All righty. Well, something else you can brag about. What do you think was your greatest political accomplishment during your 10 years as speaker? Survival. <laughs> Um, I don't know, I guess um, being able to do a you know, somewhat important job in a big state like this um, and to leave the institution, I think, maybe better than I found it. Um, and, have, and leaving on my own terms where um, speakers typically, the ones who stayed long, a long time or stayed too long, left not by choice, but left mm -hmm. by suggestion of the district attorney, <laughs> or um, their party lost the majority, um, or, or some other reason. So I, I mean, I think maybe, I guess it was an accomplishment to say that five terms is enough in that job, and that probably could have done more, but I just felt like it was time for somebody else to do it, for me to do other things. So I'm um, not sure that's a real political accomplishment, but it, it was personal to me to feel like I left on a fairly high note and wasn't chased mm -hmm. out. Yeah. So what, what are your thoughts on term limits for, for folks? You know, I, philosophically, I don't support term limits. Practically, I didn't really need to support them because during my time in the legislature, the natural turnover actually was faster than any term limit program that would be reasonable. And we had 20, 30, 40 new members in the House every two years. And, um, you know, I think there was a, a pretty good mix of those who had been there a long time and those who had just gotten there. Um, when I first got elected in 2005 in a special election, um, I was 150th in seniority out of 150. And when I left, I was there almost, I guess, f technically about 14 years, so seven terms. Um, when I left, I was in the top 20, I think. 
So, you know, 14 years is plenty of time, but there's some who've been there 50, 54 years. Mm -hmm. Tom Craddock from Midland was elected to the Texas House the same day that Richard Nixon was elected president the first time. <laughs> and he's still there. And Sinfronia Thompson from Houston, who's terrific, but she, you know, she was elected, I think, 50 years ago. So there's, I think there's a good mix of those who've been there a long time and those who've just gotten there. So Texas, I don't think it's really been, a, been an issue. Now, some of our governors are staying a long time. Mm -hmm. And maybe, maybe there's an <laughs> maybe there's a argument to be made that, that maybe in the statewide offices or something, maybe that would be appropriate. But I don't think in the legislature it's, it's, um, it's really a, a big deal here. Mm -hmm. Some of the states that, that have strict term limits really regret it and they don't know what to do to get out of it. Um, I think in Florida, I'm not sure what their term limits are, but I know that their speakers only serve a very short period of time and they select the future speakers years in advance. So there's a, like a moving up of the chairs. <clears throat> and I don't think that's such a good idea. California, I think, has term limits that they regret. They also pay them too much and they're no good. <laughs> so speaking of California, um, every so often people try to propose a, some sort of policy or, or idea that was uh, hot and popular in California. It doesn't seem to go very far when it gets to Texas. Why is that? <laughs> because they know it came from California, <laughs> primarily. <clears throat> I don't know, California today and what California was years ago, it used to be that California ideas would spread across the country in politics and in culture and everything. Not, not now. Um, mm -hmm. I can't think of something offhand that's started in California that we thought was so good recently. Yeah. Now there's one idea that's under consideration right now in the legislature, in the House of all places, which would be a, um, <clears throat> you know, there's two competing versions of property tax, how to address um, rising property taxes with a budget surplus that we have right now. And one of those, on the House side, which has never been their position before, is to limit appraisal increases to 5% instead of mm -hmm. 10. Mm -hmm. And that seems pretty close to me to what California did a lot of years ago now. Um, and I'm not sure it's a good idea. No, it, it's Believe, very reminiscent of Proposition 13. It, it sounds like it to me. And I'm not sure, it sounds good, it might feel good for a couple of years, but over time, I don't know that it's a good policy. Yep, well, I would agree with you completely on Maybe that. Maybe a way to kill it is to say, this is Prop 13 from California. <laughs> well, it is, just with a five <clears throat> instead of a one or a two. So um, could you talk a little bit about the idea of, of local control? Because that, those appraisal caps are partially about trying to limit the discretion of, of local governments. The state of Texas doesn't levy the property taxes. The, no. The locals do. Right. And that was always a, that was always a frustration of mine that we, right, we, we, they, um, legislators take the bait on this property tax thing. It's almost as if they accept the responsibility that really isn't theirs except for the fact that the state is responsible for some public school funding, for instance, which probably most of our property taxes pay for. But absent that, it isn't a state property tax. It's a local property tax. And yet state people run for office, or they run for state office, promising to do something about those local taxes. And it just leads to confusion. Um, and there really isn't in a state as big as we are, and in a state that thankfully has no income tax, which is a big reason why we've had so many corporate relocations here um, and other economic positive things. 
But in a state that doesn't have an income tax and we're heavily reliant on sales taxes um, and on local property taxes, there's only so many places to go for revenue that's, you know, significant. Um, so I, it's, it's a tough one. And I, I think it's a mistake when state leaders over promise on the property tax issue. I know it gets people hot and bothered and I don't like paying them either. I know there are a lot of problems, um, but some of the solutions are really expensive at the state level. And every time, and I was there for some of them, every time the state wants to absorb more of the local property tax burden, it gets built into our state budget forever. So the, the, they say they call it the base budget today. You would probably know the number on this, I don't. But a lot of billions of dollars has to be built into our state budget based on property tax reduction that was given years ago that you don't even notice. Um, <clears throat> and now they're talking about a really big one mm -hmm. that would just add to that, that someday I think is gonna be um, more of a burden. So I think we have to be honest with people and say government the way you want it is expensive. And we only have two ways, two real ways to pay for it right now. So but, but they are going to, they are going to do something. I don't know if it's going to be appraisal related or homestead exemption related, um, or some other combination of things. So is it harder to, um, govern harder to come up with good policy when the budget is in surplus? like it is now or when the budget is, is lean and the options are slim? I would not know the answer to that because all of the years I was there, at best we were pretty lean. And at worst, we had the most historic, deepest shortfall the state's ever had. Um, I had the privilege of being elected speaker in 2009 about the time that our economy was not in such a good shape. And it, <clears throat> it um, that first budget was difficult. There was an unexpected shortfall. The comptroller's forecast from the previous session turned out to be rosier than the reality. And so the first task for me uh, with a 76 Republican, 74 House, 74 Democrat House was to um, balance a budget that we're required to do, unlike Washington, and cut spending or find ways to balance, balance it. And we did, we got through it. It was about, I think, about a $5 billion shortfall that was unexpected, um, but we did it. And we actually passed the budget that year 150 to zero in a absolutely closely divided house. Um, <clears throat> 2011 was when it really hit the fan. We had, I can't remember the number, 20 something billion shortfall. Mm -hmm. It was dire. We cut public education funding by billions of dollars, which nobody wanted to do. Even those who don't support public education didn't want to do that. Um, but it was the only way we could get a balanced budget without raising taxes, which we never did. Um, that was really unpleasant, but we did it and we survived. I'd even argue that some of the things we did in 2011 in those budget cuts were probably finding some things we didn't think were fat that really were and trimmed it. But we grew back, the economy recovered and we did better, um, in the other terms while I was there, but we didn't do really well until after I left. I told Lieutenant Governor Patrick, if I had known that all it would take to have a big budget surplus is for me to leave, I would have checked out a long time ago. <laughs> um, but they have an <clears throat> unthinkable um, budget. I guess it's technically not a surplus, but they've got a balance right now that's 30 something billion, a rainy day fund that is overflowing, about to overflow its limit. Um, of what it can hold. And um, 
you know, I don't, I don't know. I, I, think it's, I think it is going to be difficult for them to figure out how to write a balanced budget that doesn't use all of this money, but at the same time, with this unexpected, you know, these unexpected riches, to leave this session and say, we balanced the budget with this unprecedented situation, and we did some really big, impactful, long-lasting things. I think that's going to be a challenge for them to, to do. Mm -hmm. um, and there's an awful lot of hands out and a lot of expectations for funding things that the legislature would always automatically say no to. Um, so that's not going to be fun or pleasant for them or easy. Do you think most of the trauma is going to come intra-party or between parties on, on making that budget balance? I don't. I think it's just, I don't even know if it's going to be a party thing. I think it's just a math problem. Um, and, you know, I think, I, I, I know they're not going to spend all of the money. There's constitutional spending limits. Mm -hmm. So you, they can't spend all the money. They wouldn't be allowed to, um, even if they wanted to. But to be able to balance the budget, and as I said, satisfy people's expectations um, in where we are right now, I think it's going to be a really tall order. Okay. So one of the, the ways that they're looking at spending money is uh, thinking about um, educational savings accounts and vouchers. Why do you think that idea is so popular right now? I don't know that it's that popular. I think it's really topical right now. I mean, by the way, when I first was elected to the House in 2005, it was a very hot issue. Mm -hmm. And it was pushed hard in the Texas House, and it came pretty close to passing, um, closer than it ever did after that. Um, so it's not a new idea or a new initiative, but it has new, there's a new steam behind it. I think mainly or partly because of the mishandling of the whole issue of parental rights in Virginia by Terry McAuliffe mm -hmm. and uh, you know Governor Yunkin winning winning there on that issue, generally speaking of, of parental rights. Um, and I think they I think the the traditional supporters of uh, public of private school vouchers saw that as an opportunity to you know get on the horse and ride that one. Um, it's going to be interesting to see whether there's any real movement in it or not. Um, Governor Abbott, who's never really taken a position that I know of, certainly not a strong, consistent one um, in support of vouchers, is leading the effort this time with, obviously, Lieutenant Governor Patrick, who's always been motivated. Um, the House has been steadfastly opposed in the past. Um, and I don't think that's changed a lot, but we'll find out. Um, I'm not personally a, a fan of that approach. I think school choice is important, and I think that school choice has been presented <clears throat> over the years um, in terms of, of charter schools that have proliferated. Um, a lot of them are good ones. Um, there are also opportunities within school districts where if you, if you don't want your kid going to the neighborhood school, they can, be, they can transfer to another school in the district. And in a lot of cases, they can even be given permission to transfer to schools across district lines. Mm -hmm. So there is some school choice today. Um, I think there's a lot, a lot of good arguments against a voucher or the savings um, account approach. And um, I think the House is gonna be really careful about approving anything that's too, too bold in that, in that direction. Okay. So circling back a little bit to your time as speaker, um, one of the challenges it seems to me as an outsider is the, this intergovernmental relationship between what, something the feds do 
then forces the state to react. Can you describe a situation where, where federal policy made your job as speaker more difficult? Yeah, I mean, federal government's annoying. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I mean, there were a lot of instances where the, where the you know, the, the federal bureaucracy is irritating, um, <clears throat> either in environmental issues that Texas doesn't see eye to eye on, or, I mean, any number of things. Um, I think that, um, I think that what would be, what would be nice is to see feder the federal government helping Texas in some of the areas that are our most pressing challenges. Um, I'd say on health care, where we have a bare bones Medicaid program in Texas. We only allow the most, the lowest on the, you know, lowest on the list to qualify, to qualify. There's a 70-30 match, I think, of federal and state. <clears throat> and in some cases, we are our own worst enemy in Texas in healthcare. There's some programs like in mental health care where Medicaid could cover some of those costs, but the state doesn't like the word Medicaid. So we cover it ourselves and not very well. Um, so healthcare is, a, is an area where I'd like to see more cooperation between state and federal government. And this is true even when there's a Republican majority in Texas and a Republican administration in Washington. It's never really a good relationship. Um, and then in the area of um, border security and immigration. We haven't had real leadership on that in Washington since George W. Bush was president. And that goes to you know, Republican and Democratic administrations. And all that, all that gets rewarded is you know, political, you know, going too far in political stuff. And nobody's really talking about solutions the way I wish they would. I think we're gonna have to have a president, I hope in the short order, not long term, but a president who will lead like George W. Bush tried to and uh, just not accept failure as an option. Border security and, and immigration is so destabilizing and so difficult for not only our border communities, but the whole state and the politics of our state, driven largely by that issue and not in a very helpful way. Um, so I'd like to see some practical solutions, some bipartisan compromises, and I think that's only gonna be it's only going to happen by brave presidential leadership that we haven't seen in a long time. Okay. So how does one get a brave presidential leader? <laughs> by participating, by rewarding some of the things I tried to say in the remarks opening tonight. Um, encouraging candidates to present themselves the way that 41 did and to reward them for doing it. And, you know, maybe it's wishful thinking, but someday it'll happen. Can, can you do it with a 24 hour news cycle? <laughs> yeah. And social you, media. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it's going to, it's going to take, it's going to take, you know, the right, the right leader to be willing to try it and to overcome it and to build their own following. I mean, the, the cable news networks don't, their viewership is not that, not that big. Mm -hmm. I mean, CNN has about as many people as they're in here tonight. <laughs> I mean, it's really not a big following. Um, Fox is the leader, I guess, but even they are not big enough on their own to make the difference. I don't think it'd be that difficult for, for a leader to step out and to build their own following and be really competitive, but it may not happen. Okay, well, we're, we're trying to train up a few that could take, a, take on the role here at the school, but they're not the short-term plan. 
So they've got to graduate first. <laughs> right. I've noticed that. I've, in, anybody, I'm sure those of you who work around here and spend a lot of time around here, see that and feel really good about the future. Future can't get here fast enough. Um, but what you're doing here is really building the solution that the rest of us have screwed up. Okay. Do you have any closing advice for the students in the audience on how they can follow in your footsteps, um, lead in a way that's worth following? Yeah, don't do what we did. Um, no, I just, I think they know what, they'll know what to do. They'll face, you know, they'll have their own crises to face and they'll, um, I hope, look at some of the some of the good lessons that were out there from people that came before them, um, but come up with their own solutions. And uh, the lessons they learned here at the school and with practical experience that they'll gain or some of them even have already, I think will help them a lot. But our, all of our problems are gonna be resolved by younger people. Um, and it's, it's time for younger people to to step forward. I hope that our presidential election next year, going back to that for a minute, mm -hmm. is in a couple of 80 year olds. I hope it isn't either one of those guys. <laughs> All righty, oh, well, on those inspiring notes, thank you so much for your insight. <laughs> thank you.